Uh, Joe Cribb, uh, are you yeah, ready? I'm ready, ready to take over. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Everything okay? All yes, right. Okay, well, this, this um, uh, is part of an ongoing piece of work on, on Kushan, a sort of Kushan die study. And it's just picking out a few examples um, from the reign of Kanishka to show what can be learned from uh, doing die studies. And this is work I'm doing with Robert Bracey. Um, and if you want to see how a die study is done, um, his article, which is on academia, on the die, die study of uh, Vima Cadfices gold coins is, is a, a, a model of good practice. <clears throat> I'd also like to mention um, Gorahim Khan, who, who in, in uh, Peshawar, who's been helping um, with our work um, and has republished all the coins, uh, Kushan coins found at Taxila. Um, that, that survive in the Taxila Museum. I'd also like to thank Pankaj um, and Heinz Bonds and Vic Chand um, for letting me use coins from their collections. Um, and just to say thanks to Pankaj also for inviting me to talk. It's good to see lots of old friends in the audience. Um, thank you. Okay, so um, part of what, what I'm trying to do with this sort of small snapshot is to examine the function of the reverse designs um, through, through a die study. Um, there's lots of mistaken ideas about Kushan coins. Um, so, you know, let's start off with Wikipedia. Um, it says, you know, there, there are gods from lots of different religions and they show um, that the king had um, picked out lots of different religions and amalgamated them into one system for his own belief system. Um, and the um, uh, sort of this, th they're drawing from people who've written on the subject such as Bian Mukherjee, who saw this array of different gods um, from different, cultural contexts as um, the Kushans trying to show that they're religiously tolerant. Um, and um, from, a, from a more recent study by Richard Mann on, on um, the, the meaning of coin designs uh, under Hubishka, he saw them as um, that these designs are a part of a sort of propaganda exercise to show how the, royal, how the state embraces lots of different cultures um, in order to communicate with um, kings and courts uh, both within his empire and also beyond. So let's try and please everybody um, and show them that we're, that we're very um, Catholic in our taste. Um, the, these these um, concepts are not borne out by, by the evidence. Um, First of all, to sort of take what, what does a Kushan coin design signify? Um, on, the, on the obverse, we have the king standing making an offering at an altar. Um, and on the reverse, we have a picture of a god who is making some gesture. In this case, it's the goddess Nana who's holding out her wand, um, presumably towards the king. Um, on some, she, the, the gods are making blessings, they're offering diadems, um, in place of a show, they're, they're offering uh, pouring water, lots of different um, ways of gesturing towards the king. And the Rabatak inscription found in 1993 um, makes it clear that the Kushans saw themselves as made into kings um, by the gods and Nana is specifically named as one of those gods who, who um, makes Kanishka a king. And on the famous Kanishka um, casket in Peshawar Museum, 
um, which was excavated from, from a, um, a, a site near Peshawar. Um, the inscription on it says it was an offering made to the temp to the monastery of Kanishka in the city of Kanishka. And on it, it shows Kanishka um, offering flowers to the Buddha. So the Buddha is, is on top um, of the of the car on the lid of the casket. And it, but it, but Kanishka is accompanied by two gods. Um, and they are the same gods as appear on his coin. It's um, the moon god Mao and the sun god Miro. Um, so the um, both the um, contemporary inscriptions, contemporary art and the coins are showing the same thing, that there is this relationship between the king and the gods, um, which enables the king um, to be king. The coins made, um, of the Kushans were made in the um, normal way, um, coming out of the Greek coinage tradition. Um, with the front of the coin, the obverse being on the anvil and the reverse being on the punch um, and the coin being stamped between those two dies so that the designs are raised um, by that process. Exactly the same as Roman coins, Greek coins and um, all the way down to, to the present day. The first attempt to try and um, create a logic for what uh, the coins are showing us um, was made by Robert Goebel, who uh, was of the opinion that the Kushan mint operated with four workshops and that the reverse dies were allocated to workshops. So from the first coinage, he had four gods. Um, um, that were then known. Um, you'll see there are, there are more of them than he thought. Um, and as the coinage pro uh, progressed, he saw that uh, other gods were added in and he assigned them to one of these workshops. Um, and so um, and this uh, mint, mint A is the, the main Kushan mint uh, for striking gold. Um, and he saw that there were four workshops. Well, the, um, the evidence again contradicts what he, what he suggested. Um, the the dyes um, can be studied in a variety of different ways. First of all, identifying the dyes and, and then looking at dyes to see how they change over time and to see what's happening at the mint in terms of the way the reverses are used with those obverses. So this is, this is a, um, a die from the beginning of Kanishka's reign. In the Rabatak inscription, he describes the transition from Greek uh, to an Iranian language, um, which in modern um, scholarly terms is called Bactrian. Um, and on the first dies that were used in, in Kanishka's reign at his gold mint, we can actually see that process. So the, the die starts off being inscribed in Greek um, and then it's recut um, with an Iranian inscription um, laid over the top of the, the Greek. So we can see traces of the, the Greek poking out um, behind the letters. So if you imagine that the die was engraved with the Greek inscription and then at some point it was rubbed down slightly and then recut with the Greek inscription. Um, and as well as recutting the inscription, there were various changes made. So a um, elephant goad was added to the king's hand, traces of flames on the altar were, were uh, removed, um, slight changes in the hemline um, and the way the ribbons are organized. Um, so. A, Sort of the, the the die was reworked, so we can we can see that this the the die in, in with the Bactrian inscription um, was used later than the die with the Greek inscription. So we, we're getting a sequence, and in fact, um, one can see that there are, there are two there were two dies um, being used um, at the mint to begin with, and we can see exactly the same thing happening. Um, slight changes to, to um, replace the, um, 
Greek with Bactrian, so it's traces of the Greek letters still showing, um, bits of recutting, so the, the cloak here has changed shape, the elephant goad's been added, and, and so on. The, the, this, this process can then be followed um, as the dye um, continued to be used. And in fact, with, it, with, it, with this um, dye that we just looked at, you can see that um, it went through five changes after its initial production. Um, so bef even before the, the, the Greek was recut into Bactrian, something went wrong with the, where the helmet, the, king, the king's crown is, and it was reshaped. Um, the um, some some other damage the the ribbon the um, cloak coming off here um, somehow got rubbed away um, and that, that must have happened when they rubbed the dye back for the um, to add the Bactrian um, then the flames on his shoulder were recut various odds and ends re retouched the cloak um, the shape of the cloak was changed and a scratch developed um, in, in the king's cloak. Um, so we can follow the progression of the, the dyes. And when we put that alongside the reverses, we can see that um, the reverses were used progressively um, as the dye deteriorated and, and changed. And um, we also see that there were two dyes in use um, at the mint. So we, so we know there are two workstations, not four workshops, uh, as Goebel suggested. Um, and we can see these um, bits of change taking place um, as, as the dye progressed and it gives us um, a sequence of the gods um, that, that um, were used on the reverse. So we have Nana, um, her name put into Greek. We have the sun god, who's called in Greek Helios, moon god, who's called Selene, and so feminine Greek um, moon goddess, but uh, it's very clearly a male. Um, the god of fire, Hephaestos, and the god of the wind, Animos. So Goebel thought there were four reverses. We now know there are. Um, uh, five, five reverses here, and there's one where it says Heracles in between there. There's a die that says Heracles, but we, it, we don't have yet have any examples struck from it. So then looking at this from a um, point of view of the act activities, um, the, the die, the obverse die one, going through its changes, A, B, C, um, and the, re the, the, other re the other obverse die only going through two major changes and then the reverse die is being added. So die four, which as I say we don't yet have an example of, um, is the one with Heracles on it. Um, and there seems to have been a second use of the um, die with um, Nana on it um, after the the second, the first change to the um, uh, obverse die. And this, we know that this um, die Heracles existed because the first die that we know of with the uh, Kushan god Weisho has traces of Heracles written underneath the letters. I'll come back to that and show you more clearly in a minute. Um, we can see here, this is, a die which said Hephaestos and now says Atsho and this is a god that said a die that said Selene, Selene and now says Mal. So the, as well as the obverse dies being recut, the reverse dies were being recut and from the process we can see that the changes from, uh, from Greek into Bactrian um, were done sort of on the job. Um, while, while the dyes were in use, the, these, the, they were taken out of use and, and recut. Um, so the Greek obverse here is still being used 
when two reverse dies have, have already been um, recut and the obverse die at the on the of the other workstation being used with an already recut reverse so so the they were they were as the dies weren't being used they were taking them out and the die engraver was re reworking them this is this is i said um, one of the dies says heracles um here's here's you can see oisho quite clearly but you can see the traces of the letters um, hiding behind it and um, the what the traces that are left say say Heracles. Um, there's the one that goes from Hephaestos to Asho and Cellini to Mal. Um, this this shows very clearly that these are not Greek gods but Kushan gods who were give when Greek was being was the main language being used. Um, the they would they were named in Greek, but when once they stopped using Greek, they're given their their true names in Bactrian. Um, that's the two quotes again from uh, Mukherjee and Mann, which suggest something else is going on. Um, so one could say at the bottom of the screen, these are Kushan gods with their names written in Greek and then Bactrian, not Greek gods replaced by Kushan, by Iranian or Indian gods. So in, in the third stage, um, all the recutting has been done um, and the recut die continues to be used with newly cut reverses, except one reverse um, that was one of the recuts reappears um, uh, the end of this um, uh, sequence of, uh, of die uses. Um, and so then turning that into um, a, a scheme, um, what we have is um, uh, Helios, Nanaya, um, Cellini, Heracles, Animos, Hephaestos um, being repeated um, again, Helios, Nanaya, um, and then Mao instead of Cellini, um, Oisho instead of Heracles and Atsho. Animos disappears completely from, from the gold coinage. Um, and the, um, the same continues to happen. We have Miro, then Nana, um, and then Mao, and then the, the, that um, set of dies, the obverse dies, stop being used. So we don't have anything after that. Um, Two of the coins in this, or three of the coins in this sequence, we don't, we have yet to see. Um, so the, the Heracles without being recut, the, the Cellini recut as Mao at its proper place in the sequence and um, a surviving Nanaya um, in that place. Um, and the, um, what, what appears to be going on because of that, um, Helios, you know, so, so Mithra, Nana, Mao, Mithra, Nana, Mao. Um, it looks like there's there's a deliberate sequence going on um, as as the dies work through their um, through its use, um, and so the the in, in the red square at the bottom of the screen is is what I think the sequence of the reverse dies. Um, uh, was at during this um, mint. So to um, show that, you know, that's um, diagrammatically um, how the the dies got redeployed as as the progression took place. So the red arrows show dies used it at one stage, then reappearing. Um, and there's something very strange that in in the last phase. There are two Nana dies in the sequence, and um, it suggests to me th that while they were using, while in, in this um, progression, when they were using a Nana die, if they um, needed to produce more coins during that phase, um, they produced more dies because the Nana dies are used with both the obverses. Um, or if one die broke, it was replaced by another die with the same design um, and it suggests that at these two workstations could be in the same room 
um, and that there was a box of reverse dies sitting in between them, um, and um, that as as necessary, they took the reverse die that was um, part of the operation that's going on at the moment um, to make the, the coins, but the di reverse dies moved between the two workstations. Um, and the two workstations were distinguished by the crown of the king. So with a, a crescent on his hat um, and, and a sort of Persian cap on his head. Um, if they were making, say, um, thousand coins every day, um, you know, one, one can then sort of have some sort of idea of what, what was going on. Um, um, unfortunately, we're, we're working with a sample, you know, not like Prasant's um, massive sample, but um, there are 30 coins so far surviving from that first pair of dies. So as more die, as more coins appear, then we might have to refine that slightly, but the, the broad picture uh, remains the same. Um, and then I'm going to show you two sort of um, sets of coins where you can see um, how, how, how valid is this idea that there, um, there's a progression in the gods and that they represent batches of production. So the, um, the quarters start off with a Helios um, and then work their way through um, the same sequence um, and the gradual deterioration of the obverse die uh, uh, determines the sequence and it goes exactly the same. Helios, Nana, Mao, We Show, and Ath Show. Um, and again, we it's have um, two Nanas at the same uh, in, in, in the same phase. So again, suggesting that if a die broke, it had to be replaced. And following that, uh, that this this um, the, we, one can also follow deterioration within one die, within one set of um, coins struck from the same pair of dies. Um, so Asho also um, seems to have had heavy use. Um, you know, if you find a quarter of Kanishka, it's quite often an Asho. Um, and the, we can trace the deterioration of, of that die as well. Um, once we um, sort of move on into um, Kanishka's coinage, because the quarters are quite um, scarce, one can actually follow the use of the dies. Um, and so we have um, a, the set, the next die to be used, um, uh, being used with an ash show, then being recut, um, then gradually deteriorating, and then a third die being introduced, um, and that that third die being replaced by a fourth die. Um, and we can see um, that, again, another period when so away show uh, five, uh, four, four dies being used during that sequence. Um, and coming right through to the end of the reign, um, this, is, this is the, the second phase of coinage where the crown of the king changes about midway through the reign. Um, it starts off with him uh, making uh, coins of Pharaoh being made with two reverse dies and um, that Pharaoh continuing to be used with a new obverse die and then finally with um, an Ardoxo, uh, a pair of Ardoxo dies. S stuck in between them is, is the Buddha um, coin. Um, the Buddha coin is used both with die five and die six. So it seems to sit in between um, this, coin, this production and this production, both with the same um, reverse of Pharaoh. So it, it sort of interrupts the, the Pharaoh production. Um, and this is the sort of diagrammatization of the same thing. And you can see there the Buddha dies at the bottom, interrupting the flow um, of the Pharaoh um, production. And again, two Maos there, two Nanas, four way shows, um, suggesting that it, while, while a particular reverse was in use, if it wore out, um, it had to be replaced with the same reverse before they moved on to, to the next batch of production. Um, and the, um, this is, this is um, 
a table of the of the um, production of quarter um, uh, dinars throughout Kanishka's reign. Um, so this is over a 25 year period. So one would expect there are some gaps of production. Um, but again, this sequence, so that the, the ones in brackets are the ones which we haven't yet seen, but these coins are say, incredibly rare. So we might well see these at some point in the future. Um, but in uh, taking a sort of broad picture, this same sequence of Mira, Miro, Nana, Mao, Weisho, Hatsho continues. So both the, the units and the quarters are suggesting it. Um, and if we um, take the beginning of that quarter coinage, sort of put it parallel to, to the dinar produ production at the main mint, um, we can see a um, similar process going on um, with these, again, doubling up of dyes if a particular batch was not completed using the first um, die. And it shows that the, the Buddha coins um, interrupting production between during a pharaoh phase are probably therefore a special issue. Um, the second verification was looking at the next die used at the um, Kanishka's main mint, um, of which um, it's that th this this is um, one of the workshops. Um, uh, so one, one of the workstations main uh, uh, die, the one that was recut from Greek to Bactrian. And this is the next die in the sequence, which is a, a sort of a, an almost an exact copy of it, but purely in Bactrian. And we can follow that die. I've got I've got about 40 examples and can fo follow it through through eight um, uh, recuttings. So nine stages of production and looking at all these coins with with all their reverses, um, the pattern of their use um, becomes very interesting. So down 1A, 1B, this, this, this shows the gradual recutting of the die, repairs, damage, etc. And its use with um, the dies, Miro, Nana, Mao, Weisho, and Asho. And the broad trend is that it shows that the use of dies goes through three um, periods of this re um, of this cycle of Miro, Nana, Mao, Weisho, Asho. Um, again, there's a few, um, few missing uh, coins. So we haven't got um, a couple of Atshos are missing, one Miro. But apart from those three missing, we've got the, the full record of that production. And in its last phase, it goes back to Miro and the production then stops. Um, so it's, it's very clear that um, the gods are used um, as a sequence um, and probably to mark matches of, matches of production. So you can say there are only two workstations. So Goebbels idea of four workshops doesn't correspond with what's going on. The Greek, supposedly Greek gods are not, actu not actually Greek gods, but Kushan gods. Um, Gods were used on the back of these coins to, to mark batches of production, and they weren't on the coins for propagandist reasons or to indicate religious tolerance. They were the gods, the Kushan, who gave the Kushan god kingship, and so those were the gods they um, revered, and they chose to put them on the, their coins in order to show, um, to, to keep a record of the um, progression of production at the mint. And fi finally, that the Buddha coins interrupted this sequence of production and so were probably made for special purposes. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Joe. That's uh, fascinating again. Um, I, I, let me see if there are questions. Michael has Michael, a question. Michael Bates. Uh, that was certainly a brilliant paper, without any doubt, and uh, absolutely airtight so far as I could see. But we still don't have an explanation for the use of four or five or six different um, 
reverses on the same coinage essentially, even though we now know that that is the case and how they how they were produced chronologically. So what well, what is you're avoiding the subject I see, and I don't blame you a bit, but still, can you tell us a little bit about why they would use? Are there any parallel cases, by the way, is one thing I'd like to ask. Well, up to up to this why? period, um, the um, it seems it seems fairly clear that the Indo Scythians um, use different gods at different mints. Um, you know, so so um, so the the um, each mint had a, a particular design for their coins, and um, so when you see Arzis with Zeus on one coin, Athena on another coin, um, and um, Zeus with a scepter and Zeus with Nike, those, those seem to represent different mints. The Indo-Greeks very rarely changed the gods on the back of their coins. Um, the Indo-Parthians mostly followed Indo-Scythian practice, um, but um, with, with a slightly different set of gods. Um, when the Kushans started, they, they inherited minting practice from the Indo-Greeks, from the Indo-Parthians and Indo-Scythians. And for the first um, a couple of reigns, or first three reigns, um, they tended to just use one god at each mint. Um, and um, when Vima Cadphyses started his coinage, he seems to have consolidated his production at one mint and has just has one god on the reverse. Um, for some reason, under Kanishka, the mint organization uh, changed. Um, there seems to be some traces of there being two, two workstations under um, some parts of Vima Confice's coinage. Um, uh, so, that, so that was inherited from, from the previous reign. Um, but the use of um, more than one reverse um, seems to have been a, a, in part, a practical exercise. Um, the production um, goes, you know, as, as at most mints, um, the you want you want to stay in control of the people making the coins um, by putting marks onto the coins that um, en enable you to go back to the person who's making the coins if they get something wrong. You know, so we have mint marks and similar things on on many other series of coins. Um, so for some reason they chose to um, put. Um, different gods to indicate different batches of production. Um, and, you know, if, if, the, if the intention was to um, just have lots of gods, then um, why, why, were, why were they controlling it in, in such a way? It's, it's not, not immediately obvious. Um, and when, um, you know, the, the, the the use of gods on coin is generally to show the authority of the king. Um, so um, Alexander puts um, uh, Her Heracles and Athena on his coins because they're the gods who, who he looks to for his power. And you know, most most in the Greek tradition, that's normally what happens. It, for the Kushans, they had a um, they didn't just have one god; they had a pantheon, and um, as as we can see from the Rabbitak inscription, um, there were an, a number of gods that the um, Kushans looked to as, as giving them kingship. And so, Kanishka chose to put more more of them on the coins than his father had. Um, I can't read minds beyond that. <laughs> Nor can I. I noticed you scratching your head there, and I can understand why. Yeah, Peter. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> no, that was amazing. I, you know, your mining of recutting seems like such a, a rich area for learning more. Mm. Uh, that was really amazing. 
I do have a couple questions though. I don't, I don't see why, I don't see, how do we know that the use of different gods at different periods was not for a political purpose? I don't, I don't see that we could really rule that out. And even if the Indo-Scythians uh, used specific gods at specific mints, you know, how do we know that didn't, uh, that wasn't because of different regional allegiance to different deities? That seems, that seems as plausible as, as, as that it, you're saying that it was just a convenience to identify the mint. That seems kind of reductive. I mean, I just can't imagine that it didn't mean more. Well, I, I suppose I'm, I, I tend to, to work from Try, trying to say, you know, this we can we can know this much, right? Um, one can speculate beyond that, but is it um, that does it actually give you the answer? Because once you start to speculate, there's always a multiplicity of answers. Um, and uh, you know, what what I'm trying to do is say, you know, here here from from the die study, one can see a series of events taking place, and the um, you know, we, we are what we're looking at um, is is a mint, um, and mint has mint a mint has to be regulated, um, and the, there are workmen there. You can see their hands changing, you know, changing the um, uh, designs very slightly to to um, make intentional changes and corrections, etc. But doesn't it, you know, we, we know into their minds. We uh, do know, yeah, as little as we know about the Kushans, don't we know that in the ancient world, gods often had regional connections? I mean, that seems. Well, there doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any indication of that in the Kushan period that we're aware of. Hmm. You know, there's very clearly different shrines, you know, the, 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 the Rabatak inscription um, the list of gods on the Rabatak inscription is not the same as the list of gods on the coins. Mm -hmm. Some of the some of the gods on the coins are there. Some of them are not. Um, you know, there are three there are three gods named um, in in the um, Rabatak inscription who don't appear on coins. Um, you know, so I think it it's a um, the, the the almost certainly were other shrines. You know, perhaps dedicated to to, to other gods, but. You know, Tsukatal and Rabatak are within spitting distance of each other. Um, and they're the two big shrines that we know of in, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, we now have a silver plate which talks about a dedication um, at, a, at a shrine of Waisho. Um, and you know, so, so maybe Tsukatal was dedicated to Waisho. And if we found a, a parallel description to the Rabatak, it would have. A, another list of gods which didn't quite match the ones um, at uh, Rabatak or the ones on the coins. Um, you know, we, we're, we're working with a very limited amount of evidence for the Kushan period. Um, you know, we have a tiny handful of official inscriptions um, and not, not much else really in terms of contemporary uh, documents which actually record the thought processes of, of, of the um, rulers and their courtiers at the period. <clears throat> I have one other question. I, you know, change, I can see that the idea of the syncretic pantheon may be overly simplistic. I mean, they weren't simply Greek gods and Iranian gods brought to the Kushan kingdom, but then to call them simply Kushan gods seems kind of equally reductivist in a way. I mean, that's to turn your back on their names and the fact, oh, that, and the fact that Hercules, you know, had already appeared on, on earlier uh, Kushan coins. Yeah, the, yeah, well, I think that um, the, there is, there is a, a complexity of things going on. Um, that I think that the gods that appear on Kushan coins are the gods of the Kushan kings. They're not the, they're the, not the gods of the people. 
they're the gods of the Kujan kings. Um, and the, um, the, these gods um, mu must have been worshipped before they had imagery. So when they start to um, put these into a context um, where we um, see them on coins um, and perhaps in other contexts, they had to create an iconography. And the similarities between Weisho and Heracles, I think, led them to choose initially imagery of Heracles. And then as they conquered part of India, they saw some similarities with Shiva and they also integrated imagery of Shiva into to that iconography. But it's, it's, a, construct, it's a constructed iconography. Um, but but you know, wouldn't, wouldn't Hercules have meant it may, you know, the image of Hercules may have said Wesho to the Kushan kings, mm. uh, but to people who were familiar with the image of Hercules, and I'm sure there were some of them around, mm. it would have said Hercules. So it's, it, it seems very complicated. Yeah. But do, do people look at coin? You know, if, if you ask the average English person, what person, what's on the back of a 10p piece? they almost certainly won't know um you know it's it's people you know people used coins as money and the designs on them are, are, are for primarily to control the mint and also to enable money changers to 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 handle them um the the people are are, are, are victims of the money changers and... I think the people are very interested though. I mean, the fact that- um, you're excuse me, Peter, I Peter, I'm afraid we really need to move on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is, so it, Peter it, and I are used to having these discussions. So. It, it, it is true. It, it would be nice to continue, but uh, yeah. we are a little past the time. So yeah. uh, thank you very much, Joe.